Thank you. I am delighted to be back at the New York Academy of Sciences. And we have a fascinating evening ahead of us because we're going to be looking into the future, which in some ways is already with us. Our subject is artificial intelligence, which for most people is still a rather mysterious technology. I will count myself among those people. So when I think about AI, my mind, of course, immediately goes to the movies. And it's not a pretty picture. Take Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey. Remember when Hal, the renegade lip-reading computer, says, I'm afraid I can't do that, Dave, when Dave is desperately trying to disconnect Hal. Of course, Hal then proceeds to kill all the people on the spaceship. Or consider the more recent film Ex Machina, where Nathan, the brilliant but unhinged engineer who's built a killer robot, says, one day the AIs are going to look back on us the same way we look at fossil skeletons on the plains of Africa, an upright ape living in dust with crude language and tools all set for extinction. A rather grim view of the future, I would have to say, but of course that's Hollywood. What do you expect? Uh, in reality, AI is already all around us. Siri, Alexa, Netflix, Facebook, smartphones, spam filters, facial recognition software, Google Maps, Uber, it is everywhere. And unless you are unplugged and living off the grid, this is already part of your world. So there's a lot of mythology around AI, and we are going to unpack this this evening on everything from the current state of the technology to where it's headed to larger philosophical questions. What does it mean to be human in the age of the smart machine? I have to say that last week I emailed our two speakers some of the questions I wanted to explore this evening, and one response I got was, you have enough hard questions for a discussion lasting a few days. <laughs> so let's just say we have, we have plenty to talk about here, and we are lucky to have two very knowledgeable people to help us make sense of it all, and let me introduce them. Roger Antonsen is a professor in the Department of Informatics at the University of Oslo and is also currently a visiting scholar at UC Berkeley in California. He's a logician, mathematician, computer scientist, researcher, author, and public speaker who specializes in proof theory, mathematical logic, complexity theory, automata, and the philosophy of mathematics. He's the author of Logical Methods, the Art of Thinking Abstractly and Mathematically, as well as many scientific articles and book chapters. His public talks have explored how a slight change in perspective can reveal patterns, numbers, and formulas as the gateways to empathy and understanding. Barbara Gross is a professor of natural sciences at Harvard University. She has served as the dean of Harvard's Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study and was the institute's first dean of science, designing and building its science program. She currently serves on the science board and science steering committee at the Santa Fe Institute, and she has made seminal contributions to the fields of natural language processing and multi-agent systems. She developed some of the earliest computer dialogue systems and established the research field of computational modeling of discourse. Her current research explores how collaborative multi-agent systems and collaborative interfaces can improve systems for healthcare planning and communication. Welcome, both of you. Thank you. Thank you. So both of you work at the interface of computers, mathematics, language, what we might call the building blocks of artificial intelligence. And Barbara, let me start with you. Why do you find all of this so interesting? Because the, the ways in which people work, their psychology, their cognitive processing is fascinating to me. It has been from an early age when I would listen to people and try to figure out why they were doing what they were doing and saying what they were saying. And um, Alan Turing, who is the father of computer science and wrote the paper that's thought to have launched the field of artificial intelligence, uh, said in that paper that we don't, something like this, it's not a direct quote, we don't, we don't really know what thinking is. It's still mysterious to us, but by trying to get computers to think, we will probably learn a lot about how we think. And that's what brought me to the field. And it's still the case we don't, that thinking is mysterious. Um, but we have developed methods and models that help us understand a little bit about what's going on. And for me, that's fascinating. So Roger, what about you? Well, first of all, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, more seriously, 
I enjoy the fact that we can represent patterns with you know, symbolic languages and somehow understand things better by doing that. We can take something that we love and we can represent it with a computer program and we can let it run and something happens. From very simple rules, if you do the right thing, um, a certain complexity emerges. And that phenomenon is so fascinating to me. So it's, it's always beautiful to, to look at that uh, happen. What, what makes it beautiful? What makes anything beautiful? I mean, this is, it's uh, because with a computer you can do things that you didn't expect. You, you, can, you can know the rules ahead of time, but then something kind of magical happens. It's like a game of chess. The, you can define the rules, that's easy, but then a whole world of, of game emerges from that. And I think, I think that's very beautiful. I don't know why, but it's full of patterns, and I, I think that's what makes anything beautiful. I'm, I'm curious about where this interest, for both of you, uh, where it comes from in your own life. And if we go back to uh, your childhood, your, your adolescence, I mean, were you, were you math geeks? Were you interested in computers, uh, Barbara? When, when did you start getting interested in this? So um, I always loved numbers and playing with numbers. I had favorite numbers when I was a child, 48 and 64. Um, <laughs> But when I, when I was in school, which you can tell a little bit from my gray hair, was not in the last decade or so, um, uh, it was thought that girls couldn't do mathematics. And in fact, only when I got to seventh grade did I have a teacher who told me that I actually was quite good at it, and it was OK for me to speak up in class. Um, and when I went to college, my mother said I should tell people that I was majoring in Urdu because boys would be scared off if they knew I was a math major. <laughs> I still loved math because it's like Roger said, it's really beautiful. Um, and also you can control it in a certain way that you cannot control the natural world as many of you have probably noticed. Um, it was like puzzles. Um, and then you could make new things happen. And so when did you actually start studying computer science? So when I was in college, there were no undergraduate majors. I started studying college, uh, uh, computer science when I went to graduate school. And um, I started out in a very mathematical area of computer science. Um, and actually, I explored both scientific computing and theoretical computer science. And at some point, I realized that I love the solutions, but not the problems. And the problems that fascinated me were the problems of cognition and how people think, how they communicate, um, when it doesn't work as much as when it does work. I think really we understand as much about thinking and cognition, and for that matter, AI systems, when we see the errors that they make as opposed to just when they succeed. So Roger, what about you? How far back do, do these interests go? Um, it's hard to say. I also like math, but... Um School didn't really follow up, so I was a little bit bored. <laughs> I know we have certain problems with with math and computer science education, and I, I think I was left by myself for for too too long. So in in the classroom, um, I didn't really get any challenges. So really, when I started university uh, studies, I took actually uh, Latin first, and then philosophy. And after philosophy, I took uh, discrete mathematics and computer science, and I was forever in love in, with that world. Um, because it's uh, it's 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 very beautiful. <laughs> it is <laughs> it's an amazing world that nobody uh, had properly shown me before. So it was it was full of uh, more general patterns and. But then then again, it it I think I always was interested, but never had the proper proper introduction to it. So it's so interesting hearing both of your stories about, for, for different reasons, going back to the problems that you had studying mathematics and, and maybe later computer science. And it sort of it raises a, a question for me, having watched my own children go through this. Do you think every kid should, should be required to study computer science in school? So I'm not a big fan of requirements. So let me say I think every child should be inspired to study computer science because um, it's fun, that's the first thing to say. Um, it's really designed. Many people think that what it means to uh, study computer science or be a computer scientist is that you're in an office by yourself programming. But that's not really what it's about. Um, I mean, it's part of what it's about. 
um, designing a program is like designing a building, fi figuring out what the parts are, how those parts should interact, where the possible conflicts can happen, how you can do, how, how you can do a design that works better or not so well. Um, it's also much like writing a book when you, or writing a paper when you figure out what the different parts are. Um, it's not just typing. I mean, by the time you get to typing the words, you've figured out, you've figured out a lot. But, so but isn't, isn't it, also, the, it also teaches you um, how to think, I would say logically, but I don't mean it quite in the sense that Roger was talking about logic. It really teaches problem solving. And in a way, and this is what's amazing about computer systems, you think you have a solution to the problem, and you try it out, and it doesn't work. And then you figure out where your thinking wasn't right. So in fact, I always say to the, my advisees, my undergraduate advisees, that they might be able to write the essay for their freshman English class between 3 AM and 5 AM, which, believe me, they try to do. But they aren't going to be able to write the program for their first computer science course then and have it work because you can't fool a computer like you can fool a faculty member. <laughs> but, it, but isn't the more the, the pedagogical question, should, re, should you require computer coding, let's say, in either grade school or high school? I mean, should that be a, a required thing to, to learn? Uh, well, in the end, if you want to get a computer to do something, you have to code. So um, the answer is yes, but if you have a... Just like you can't write a book if you don't, or a paper if you don't know how to either write by hand or type. So um, it's also learning how to program is learning how to speak a foreign language. And it's an interesting foreign language because, as I said, the interpreter of it isn't quite as smart as we are. So you have to be very careful about what you say. But I don't think that the coding comes first. I think the design comes first in understanding the problem. And um, also, I think what's very important about it, and I think this will get back to something Roger cares a lot about, is that you have to experiment. You have to you, you write it, and you see if it works. And if not, you adjust it, and you try again. And unlike chemistry, where you can lose a thumb or blow up your house, if the program goes wrong, it's just in the computer. So, Roger, uh, yeah. computer coding for everyone in school? Uh, absolutely. I think if, if done right, um, algorithmic thinking and computational thinking should be a part of the curriculum from kindergarten up. Because it, it can be done. If it, and it, if it's done well, it, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. And for some of the reasons you mentioned that I, I absolutely agree with, um, you interact with a computer program like you are not interacting with a book or, or, or some other things. So I've been thinking about art <laughs> and how, how we make art and how we can use a computer to make art instead of just uh, you know uh, a brush or a, or a pencil or a typewriter. And there's something pretty interesting happening when you've made your own algorithm and it does something. And maybe it does something unexpected. And by doing that, you learn something about what you shouldn't have done. And then it, it teaches you almost automatically that uh, there are other paths that you could have taken. And that, that journey for me and I think for many other people has been very magical where you're, you're interacting and becoming a part of a program, sort of. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's, I, I, mean, I said, if done right, it, it is very, very good for, for uh, learning. And I think you learn a lot about abstraction in a very good way. You learn about patterns in a very good way. And I think it can be done in any, any uh, field. Uh, it mm -hmm. could be done for languages. It could be done for f physical exercise. It could be done for mathematics and natural sciences, of course. But you can take anything and you can program it. And I think you learn uh, a lot from that. Yeah, one of the things I think has, is an exciting development of the last few years is the proliferation of ways to teach programming that even four and five-year-olds can use because the language in which you instruct the computer has been made very simple. Sometimes it's a language when you're actually doing something as opposed to typing words. And it's exactly what Roger says. You're immediately seeing the effects of what you're doing. So, so I would love to, to put this whole subject of artificial intelligence into some historical perspective. I'm wondering, for instance, how, let's say, if we were to com compare the state of research on AI in, let's say, the 1970s to today, how much it has changed over that time? Uh, can you give us some perspective? Sure. It's changed enormously. But I want to give you a piece of... Um, 
a perspective that isn't about AI per se, but about computing technology. So when I entered the field of AI, which was in 1973, um, I had a colleague. So how many of you know what a carriage return is? OK, so OK, <laughs> enough that I can say this. It's like the energy, but it really made something happen. <laughs> Um, so, well, because we had teletypes then, not the lovely computers we have now. Um, she knit sweaters, I think at least one a week, waiting for the carriage return to Echo. <laughs> the smartphones you carry around have much more power than the rooms this big full of computers. So, and that's made a tremendous difference. So many of the techniques that are being used now in AI systems were actually discovered, designed in the 70s, but they didn't work because computers were so slow and they had so little memory, um, just didn't happen. So much of the language processing that goes on, the um, uh, information retrieval methods under them, people in the in the 60s and 70s had thought of. So that's one big thing. So, so obviously the technology has advanced. I mean, right. it's just, you know, right. it's just much more powerful now. But what about the conceptual model so of AI? So that's what I wanted to, to move to next. So in the, um, there are basically um, two different ways to, that, two different types of methods that have been used in AI. And in the 70s and 80s and into the early 90s, people use what I'll, um, what I'll call model-based methods. And by that, I mean they developed, they used symbols in the computer system to represent things in the world, and they actually gave meaning to those symbols, and then the computer manipulated them. Now, some of those approaches were logic-based, and I'm going to leave to our logician here to explain what that means. Um, and some of them, starting in the mid-'80s, were based in probability and statistics. So the... Um, the uh, logic-based methods had certain advantages, which Roger may tell you about. The statistically based, uh, the probabilistically based methods had the advantage of being able to deal with uncertainty in the world, which the logic-based methods didn't. And then um, more recently, so those are all model-based, where there's a symbol, and then that symbol is connected to the world in some way that's in the designer's head. Then what I'll call data-driven methods. And um, this is where I get to explain that deep learning and deep neural nets do not have a philosopher's deepness. You should not be misled by the word deep. Um, <laughs> it's used to mean that there are multiple levels of representation in the computer, multiple levels of networks. I thought I thought deep learning was all about the computers, or basically, I mean, this you know sophisticated AI was going to basically be able to think like human beings. I mean, that was sort of, you know develop sort of own <laughs> systems of thinking, uh, you know that that we do. No. Well, maybe, but not just with the methods that underlie deep learning. Um, anyway, so that's that's been the change now. Um, the recent advances that everybody sees in being able to process images and being able to um, uh, understand what you say to your phone in, in speech are rooted in those methods, and they work really, really well in those kind of perceptual areas because thanks to all of you and your friends, your relatives, your children, your grandchildren, or your parents, there's a lot of data out in the world now and certain corporations have that data, and they can process it using these, these statistical methods, and they do really well if you remember to give them all the data they need to do really well. But if you don't, then they make mistakes. And um, they have their own kind of brittleness, which I'm happy to talk about later. Well, let me, let me rephrase the question in a different way, and, and Roger, I'll, I'll ask you this. Uh, is the ultimate goal of AI to create machines that Think. I know that's a problematic word, but that think like the human brain? <laughs> I think there are many approaches to that. One is, yeah, sure, let's take the brain and simulate the brain and see what happens. Another is, let's mimic the brain and do certain things like the brain. There's a good analogy with, you know, birds and flying planes. So we don't really want, we want to 
fly, but we really don't want to fly like birds, but we want to fly. And we have managed to fly quite well with airplanes. And so we, m we might want to go to somewhere where there is intelligence uh, without actually going through the brain route. We can go there some other way. And I think these methods we see flourish nowadays, they are an example of that because our brain doesn't work exactly like that. Very crudely, yeah, you could say that, you know, in our brains we have neurons and we're, we're modeling something or using methods that are inspired by how our brain works, but it's not really how the brain works. However, these methods might be extremely good at some things, even better than our brain, and it's sh showing to, to be. So what's what's better than what our human brains can do well computers with the proper training um, can be used to detect patterns in ways that we humans are not able to um, because of its sheer complexity so you can see some methods based um, that are um, made for image recognition or facial recognition uh, being used for other things like detecting cancer so when people say it's just for facial recognition, well, no, you can actually use it for other things as well. So this, this field of um, image recognition is really more broad than people think. So you, you, you've probably seen the, the Go um, the story where AlphaGo uh, wins over um, the human. Which is a, was, was the last game that supposedly computers would never be able to beat humans at, right? I mean, you know, right. hum, human, I mean, com, uh, and it's, computers conquered chess, but then Go is supposed to be this thing that the, the computers couldn't go there. But. but come on, it's not really that surprising that computers surpass humans in that game, I think, because the game is finite, it's combinatorial, you can search through a lot of things, and you can recognize certain patterns. So uh, to me, that is not surprising. I think it's a wonderful and remarkable result, an amazing result, but it's not really that surprising that we can do that. So, so, so computers are much better than people at digesting, I'll say, a lot of data, and as Roger said, seeing patterns in it, and they can also be used, as happened in Go, to try things over repeatedly and learn from the data that they generate themselves, which they can do very well for, um, for games, but it's much harder to do for the real world. Uh, I, wanted, I just wanted to go back to um, something that Roger was saying and, and note that they're really, um, you asked about goals for AI. So we like to think about two different kinds of goals for the field. One is a scientific goal of understanding what the kinds of behaviors that are thought to be intelligent in people, and the other is an engineering goal. And the techniques you use so far as we know now, could be rather different for those two goals. So the methods that are making a big difference in image processing now um, are wonderful for engineering. It's not clear they're really shedding light on um, how we think or on cognitive behavior, and that's fine. I mean, we, AI is making a huge difference in the world um, with some of the um, both image processing and language work. Can, can, we, can we use the word think when it comes to computers? Do computers think? Well, you know what Alan Turing said about that? That, that, that was just fraught with trying to understand what the word think meant. So um, I kind of side with Alan Turing. But I, did, I wanted to get back to something that's kind of underneath this question of computers and can they... Well, should they think like us? I agree entirely with Roger. Why? I mean, when you, we, I, th I mean, I think we can say something about why, but when you use a computer to model systems in the physical world, you don't expect them to do it or act like those systems in the world. And yet, there's something that just grabs people when you're modeling us and our thinking that, that suddenly, they want to know if it's going to be like us or if it's going to take over. And I did, you opened with talking about right. science fiction. So I wanted to point out that people's fear, and it's really fear that gets reflected in the science fiction. That, that the robots are going to take yeah. over and get rid of us. Right. But this is an old fear that goes back at least to the Golem of Prague, which was in the 1500s, something made of clay, right, that, you know, acted like us. So... Uh, by the way, this is a deep-seated fear in the Western world, 
it's not there in Japan. So there's, there's something going on here, but that's what Frankenstein was about. And um, So I, are, you, are you saying that we shouldn't worry about that? that, uh, I, that I am. Yeah. That, <laughs> so Elon Musk is wrong. Stephen Hawking was wrong. That's I mean, there right. are these people who've said that, you know, watch out. I mean, you know, runaway mm -hmm. AI could take over, eliminate us. I, I think there are many things to worry about, many right now with AI systems, and that those worries are distracting us from paying attention to the things that we should be concerned about, and that everybody in this room could be taking action to help get more attention paid to. So Okay, I, I'm yeah. going to come back to those later, but Roger, uh, you don't worry about AI taking over? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm not worried. I there are. I'm worried about a lot of things, but not particularly that. Um, it's an interesting question, though. But I'm not worried. No. And what about that question of do computers think? Is uh, how how would you respond to that? Uh, does a tree think? So. I, I, so what constitutes thinking? It's a hard question. And we, but we use words very uh, haphazardly. What's this word? Um, e easily. We, we say that the computer didn't understand me, or the computer is thinking now, and the computer remembered. My phone doesn't remember. We use all these words that we use for humans about our things. But I, let me just, let me just follow up we, on the trees for a moment. And actually, that's a very interesting question, because okay. trees have all kinds of ways of responding to natural mm. stimuli to whether it's uh, insects, whether it's wind patterns, and they respond based on all of this stuff. You, you could, I don't know, is that thinking? Yeah, is it conscious? So there are all, all these things that are hard to define, and we're poke, poking into them. You know, life, thinking, consciousness, understanding, and these, these words are all vague, and they can be defined in different ways. When you settle on the definition, then you can answer those questions. But that's the hard part. So how, <laughs> how, how to define all these <laughs> well, words? Well, okay. I mean, let, um, okay, let's just throw out that word conscious. So, I mean, when people talk about consciousness, does something have consciousness? It usually means, is there subjective experience? Does, you know, is there a, can there be a feeling of pleasure or pain? Uh, is that would that be possible for computers or uh, computer systems AI? Sure, why not? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, seriously, so, why not? I mean, that's 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 the thing. So, if you can prove to me that it's imp it's imp it's impossible for some reason, I would I would go along with that. But so why not? Impossibility is always hard <laughs> to prove, except yes. in certain mathematical context. Yes. Um, but I'll ask the question of whether an an agent, so I'm already presupposing agency and autonomy, um, needs to be alive to be conscious. And what's the answer? Well, I think so, and I don't <laughs> think machines are alive. Yeah, so <laughs> you can, <laughs> but why not go there all the way? We can make consciousness. Why not? So the simplest proof of that is that nature has built a thing that is conscious, and it's, it's our brain. So it's certainly possible to configure stuff, matter, in such a way that it becomes conscious. Easy. Proof done. <laughs> you know, ostensibly, we are here, we're conscious. Why can't we not en engineer that? That's the hard question. And yeah, why not? I think the answer is we don't know. Yeah. But you can't tell by the words that we use. Actually, Turing also said this. He predicted not only something about the so-called Turing test, but he predicted that 50 years from when he wrote this program, which was the, he wrote it in 1950, so 2000, that people would talk about machines thinking and nobody would question them. And as mm. Rogers pointed out, we all do it. But that's attribution to, an, to, an, to the machine. And we know there's some really wonderful studies that show that you don't have to be any, a complicated machine for people to attribute even intentions to you. So there are psychology experiments where they have like little balls moving around on a screen and it's triangles, and the balls are, I quote, chasing the triangles. Now, I don't know about you, but I have trouble <laughs> attributing consciousness or intention to it, and yet 
as people trying to explain what's going on, we find it very useful to do that attribution. Yeah, and it's, it's very easy to do this. You can take a cardboard box, and this was actually an experiment in New York, a uh, cardboard box with a little flag that says help. And, you, and the only thing this robot does is go, go forward. It's what's called tweenbot or something, and they made videos of this. And people, you know, had empathy with this thing. It's a cardboard box with wheels, <laughs> with a flag that says help. <laughs> I'm, I need to go to the south corner. And people are like, and it fell over, and people were like, oh, oh. <laughs> And if it takes that little to get empathy with the machine, think about what's going on now. We have voice assistants and we have these AIs that are, you know, much more, um, <laughs> what, what's the word, powerful. powerful, and it's easy to attrib attribute these things. So, so, so it sounds like one of the differences between your two perspectives is for you, Roger, the line between alive and not alive is not so significant in terms of some of these other things that we talk about, whether it's consciousness or uh, maybe even thinking, whereas for you, Barbara, that's, that's a fundamental dividing line. Do I have that right? At the moment, yeah, Till somebody shows me otherwise. And I, I do want to go back to your question because I think, I think <laughs> that one could ask about kinds of thinking. And so we talked earlier about machines being very good at taking large amounts of data and recognizing patterns. But they're not very good at determining causes and effects. And they have no capability to uh, do what's called reason, reason counterfactually or hypothetically. If I go this direction, this will happen. And if I go that direction, this will happen. So which direction should I go? Well, let me follow up on that because it seems like some of these questions come into play with the driverless car which we hear is, you know, is, is coming. It's, you know, we were did 20 years from now, most trucks are going to be, you know, speeding down the highway without any drivers or so we are told, and, and the world will be much safer. And presumably, to be able to do that, those driverless cars have to be able to be weighing all these different factors and maybe even, I don't know, counterfactuals, I don't know if that comes into play here. How far can that technology go, the, the driverless car? Well, for our own um, uh, uh, safety and well-being, we can hope that we do have driverless cars. Um, the question is not whether they could happen, but what, what social things, what political things have to happen for them to be able to operate in this world, which reminds me that in in my, when I was just beginning to study AI, I did finally read science fiction. I hadn't read it before. And I heard an interview with Isaac Asimov who said that the easy part of writing science fiction was figure, it was imagining the technology. The hard part was getting the social interaction right. But is, and, that, is that true with the driverless car, though? Because yeah, I, I, I think we, that yeah. the technology would be incredibly hard, I mean, to weigh all the factors that might happen out there, you know, dealing with other people, other right. cars, and all of that. Right. Well, that's, that's to my point. If, if um, and I, I don't know if it will happen in 20 years or not, if we all got off the streets, if every person stopped driving, and either people stopped walking and riding bicycles, or they agree, we kind of strip, can you imagine this? Just shut down all the streets one day and reopen them, and some are only for uh, autonomous vehicles and some are for us. Or reconfigure the highway so that there's certain lanes that only the autonomous vehicles go on and lanes that, that we go on. I, I, I described this to somebody and said, yeah, those lanes for the autonomous vehicles, they're called trains. <laughs> Then it would happen much faster. The, the problem machines have is us. We're irrational. We don't follow the rules. And how on earth are they supposed to figure out what we're going to do? And that's where the autonomous vehicles now are having trouble. I'm telling you, it's just us. But you know what? We were here first. <laughs> <laughs> Roger, your take on driverless cars? Yeah, I welcome them. I think the world would be safer with them. I mean, it's pretty obvious. This is a limited domain, driving cars it, 99 percent or whatever ratio it is is normal traffic in and there are rules and it should be uh, manageable enough so but there are extremes so you know he, the, he the, the one Oslo extreme is that okay Boston. there's a guy there <laughs> and this person <laughs> is <laughs> sorry Roger I just, that person is I just insane. To point out reality so here if the car had a full model of, of everyone it would say okay that's that's a crazy person he's gonna go into the street now so we should stop the car 
that's not going to happen because then you need a full model of you know psychology and, and human beings and you have to think counterfactually about what if that person now you know climbs up there and jumps over there that the, that the computer's not going to go there but most traffic is not like that so i uh, yeah, for the record, it, it is a little you, quieter. You know, I'm getting worried about you, Roger, because I understand you're going to Boston tomorrow. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, I mean, what, what I hear you saying is that the driverless car will Would probably prevent a number of accidents Absolutely. that now happen, but yeah. there's and there's a limit to the, the sophistication of the technology. Right. What I find troubling is that we, we set the bar higher for, for, for uh, things than for humans. I find this in the AI discussion that we often, oh, we can't have these uh, automatic cars because if there's this very particular scenario, it's going to kill people. No, I think, I think in most situations, a human would have equal problems with this. So there, I think a lot of these are fringe examples. So I, I think I'm an there's, well, there are some fringe examples, which I hope we won't mention. But... Um, <laughs> They're real examples, like the woman with the bicycle in Arizona, who where the where the car didn't understand that was a woman with a bicycle and not a trash bag or something like that. So I, I just want to say I agree entirely with Roger that we would be safer. I hope we see the day of driverless cars. Actually, I hope it happens soon because I'm tired of driving in Boston. <laughs> um, and not every... Um, whatever they're called, I don't want to advertise any company, you know, sh ride share drivers are good and certainly not every Boston taxi cab driver is good. But So I think that, that there's a lot that could be done. It's a difference between asking about autonomous vehicles in the future and autonomous vehicles using the technology we have now. And I'm not convinced the technology we have now will get us there, although it has gotten us a long way toward there. But that's fascinating. But what you're saying is, I mean, this example of the computer in the car could not distinguish between what a trash bag and a bicycle and i mean that's so let me tell you i mean that isn't that let me tell you something if you take a <laughs> stop sign and you put a few big band-aids on it the computer could mistake it for a speed limit sign or a yield sign and we've run those experiments you take certain images and you just twiddle a few pixels or those little dots that you sometimes see I guess people who have digital cameras know what pixels are now. Um, you just twiddle a few of them. A human being looking at it can't see a difference. And suddenly, a poodle turns into a giraffe or worse. So they're very sensitive to the data they get. And there's actually some serious um, ethical societal issues about how they can be hacked. Well, doesn't so, that make you worried then? I mean, if just these little tweaks in what something looks like can throw the computer totally off and potentially do something disastrous, that makes what, me worried. That's what, I, that's what I want everybody in this room to worry about, not super intelligence is taking over. <laughs> and, you know, truth in advertising, time to demand that of AI systems. So, Roger, what Yeah, I, ag I agree. Some some of these systems are very fragile, and um, you can you can f you can fool them if you do the right things, which um, leads us to another problem with with a lot of these AI systems is how how to prove that they do the right thing, because in so my f my field is logic and mathematics where you have proofs that and mm -hmm. proofs give you absolute certainty that this thing operates in a certain way, and for example in in programming you have um, program verification, where you can actually have a mathematical proof that your computer program adheres to a certain specification. Now, come along with, a, with an AI system for doing uh, one thing or another. Uh, I would like to see a proof if that this thing um, adheres to a certain specification, that it wouldn't kill anybody or do anything crazy, or that changing one mm -hmm. little thing would, mm -hmm. would, would ruin the whole system. But that's incredibly hard. Uh, but this is current research. People are tr trying to get there and trying to f fix that. And it, ne it needs to be thought about. But it, I mean, isn't that partly the underlying problem with artificial intelligence is assessing a situation that changes. There are some new variables that come in, and can the computer handle that? Can it recognize that, oh, this little thing has changed. It doesn't have to subvert the whole system. So, so you asked about human intelligence versus artificial intelligence, and that's, um, that's a challenge that has yet to be met. 
but I want to be clear that there's a difference between artificial intelligence writ large and what the current methods that are succeeding in engineering systems with certain capabilities today do. And so people are working on various facets that might be able to give you this, but we aren't there yet. Yeah, we, we perhaps we should have started there with just <laughs> defining what we mean by artificial intelligence because it's very, very vague. One, one, one definition is very narrow, and it's called narrow of artificial intelligence, where you want to just do something in particular, like detecting faces. And then we have the broader general artificial intelligence, which is a much, much harder thing to talk about, which is all this about the brain and being conscious and all that. And well, well, let me ask you about the Turing test, which, Barbara, you... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you you mentioned earlier. Now, my impression was that for a long time, people thought this was the gold standard of artificial intelligence. I mean, could you basically uh, construct a system where you couldn't tell the difference between were you talking to a computer or whether you were talking to a human being? So, um, sorry, I guffawed, and I <laughs> probably shouldn't have it gave away my answer. Um, so I want to say first, Alan Turing was absolutely brilliant. I mean, really, he... He started every area of computer science, theoretical computer science, systems, and artificial intelligence, all the, everything except graphics and all the fancy stuff that all the games depend on. Um, he was asking a philosophical question at a time when um, the predominant uh, uh, techniques in investigation bio in uh, psychology were behaviorism. So if you do something, what happens? Just seeing that, not looking inside at all. And, and his suggestion of the Turing, t what he called the imitation game, but has now become uh, known as the Turing test, was in that vein. And it's possible um, that a machine could not pass, could, could only, let me try and put it in the positive, could only be able to pass the Turing test if it had something like our intelligent behavior. But there are two things to say. First, no, despite what you might have read in the press, no computer has passed the Turing test. Turing did not limit the task to five minutes, one domain, or any of the things that you've read about. And the reason that's important is that every, every program that has, quote, won some modified supposed Turing test has done it by hackery and trickery. Um, that, that's true. Um, <laughs> and the second thing is the Turing test is a very bad way to drive research or even measurement in a field because either a computer passes it or it doesn't. Science proceeds incrementally. I mean, anybody who's a biologist or a physicist or a chemist, even a mathematician knows that you prove a little bit and then you prove more. You find something and then things change. There's no way to test incremental progress toward but the Turing test. Why, why is this so hard for a computer to do, for AI to do, to basically to carry on a conversation so that it basically can, uh, can sound or appear to be human? What, 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 what makes that so difficult? because carrying on a conversation requires a lot of cognitive capacity. It's not just taking a string and mapping it into something. There's a reason that you can, um, that search engines have succeeded so well and asking individual questions of a computer have succeeded so well, mostly. And yet, if you try and have a dialogue with a system, it goes off the tracks pretty easily, which is why most of these um, consumer advisor systems that you chat with, um, if, if, you don't, if you don't have a problem that matches the script that they've been given, then they can't help you. Um, there was a, a Barbie doll that was announced some years ago that was supposed to be your daughter's best friend. It was on the front page of the New York Times Magazine. It could speak. Um, it was very easy for it to go wrong. And I, had, I uh, have t teach a course on intelligent systems design and ethical challenges. And some of the, the students do a project. And some of the students bought a Barbie doll and experimented with it. And it didn't, it didn't take very long for this Barbie doll to go off the tracks. 
When you say go off the tracks, what do you mean? Give um, me an example. So I'll give you an example. There's actually this dialogue is in the New York Times Magazine. The doll, I won't get the whole dialogue, but the doll um, uh, s uh, finds out that the child has a sister and asks the child what nice things the sister has done for her. And the child says, my sister does nothing nice for me. And the <laughs> system says, well, tell me one thing she's done. <laughs> it goes on, and I think it ends with something like, have you told your sister how much you appreciate her these days? <laughs> I mean, so now think about this. I mean, I, I could get on my soapbox about ethics. This is a doll for a child between three and eight when we're hoping to teach children that they should listen to other people, and this doll is stone deaf to the child. <laughs> and it's supposed to be her best friend. Okay, the child at some point is not so nice to the doll, and the doll still smiles back. I have never met an unremittingly pleasant four-year-old, though I have met many adorable four-year-olds. Um, what you know? So there's that's an example. I um, one of my other examples, which um, I use use in the class, I always have to test it ahead of time. So if you go away and try it out and it works, just wait a few weeks and it won't work. You can, <coughs> you can ask your smartphone where the nearest emergency room is and you'll get the nearest emergency room. You can ask it where you should go to get a sprained ankle treated and it might give you a web page that tells you how to treat a sprained ankle. That is, I thank you for laughing, <laughs> whoever you are, thank you. <laughs> Because that's funny, but if you had asked about getting a stroke victim or a heart attack victim treated, you wouldn't have wanted a web page. You would have wanted somebody to call 911. So, oh, and you, when we were talking about this earlier, you were saying that if you ask, where is the nearest place I can get a flu shot? Yeah, the answer I got was, is that a music group or a something other group? <laughs> I couldn't figure out for the longest time where this came from until... Uh, a slightly younger colleague of mine pointed out that it was probably confusing a flu shot with something that might be a music group. I just didn't get that parsing of the scent. Yeah. So, so Roger, from your perspective, why is it so hard for a computer, for an AI system, to carry on this kind of a conversation that we would associate as being so so basic? Well, first and foremost, it's because human speech and our conversations are incredibly complex and subtle. In order for anything to anything to uh, quote unquote understand uh, what you say, there's so much going on. If I say yeah right, it means no, but the computer hears yeah right. It should be able to figure that out from the context, because if I have made a joke earlier, if I am in a particular mood, I say certain things. How is the computer um, expected to build an appropriate model of all of that in order to get back to me realistically? So understanding what we are saying to each other and what we mean by that is incredibly complex. You're talking so, about partly so, so intonation think, as well. So, so intonation I, for one thing and how we use our voices um, and how we communicate meaning with voices is is such a huge area. <laughs> so, so, yeah. So, so um, you're right, but I don't think the intonation on "yeah, right" is actually where it's hard. Um, I because agree. We, because there are much better because examples. The, um, yeah, I'm going to get there in a minute. <laughs> but because the signal processing, speech processing, has got much much better, and you can use a lot of data to do it. But fundamentally, and I think that's, this is what you were getting at with that example, Roger, you can't carry on a dialogue or a conversation with someone if you don't understand why they're saying what they're saying. You have to understand the intentions behind what they're saying. So, um, and what you were doing with your intonation uh, was conveying an intention. And that you can't do from individual. So a conversation, I have a lovely abstract example, which I can't give here. But a conversation is not, and for that matter, a text, but this written on this piece of paper. It's not a matter of adding one sentence to another to another. The relationship among the things you say is very complicated, as, as Roger was saying. And in fact, 
intonation also signals those relationships. So, so is that something that AI in the future will be able to, to figure out, intention? And what you're saying is meaning. Yeah, why not? I mean, I'm an optimist, so, but, it's, but it's also one of the most complex things you can do. It's not easy because it, it relies on having a model of why we say things we do and how we say them. And that's, that's not an easy... You'd, so it's not sufficient with a pattern recognizer for that. You have to have something else. You have to have some sort of model, some sort of theory of mind, some sort of theory of psychology, some sort of in more information than just purely word for word what you said. So this comes back to where we started then, which is what, what, what the goals of AI. You are, okay, you've just raised theory of mind. I mean, you are basically saying, okay, one of the goals has to be to think sort of like what human beings do, to, to mimic to some degree what the human brain does. Right? In order to be successful, I think you need to approach that or at least build up some sort of model in which you can reason about certain things. Yeah, so um, the, um, so I agree I'm with Roger. I'm also optimistic, but I'm not optimistic we can get there with the current methods that do well on search engines. And it's for just the reason he said, because it's beyond, I would conjecture, um, beyond pattern matching. I just wanted to point out that the phrase theory of mind is used in psychology and related fields not to mean a theory of how the brain works, but that we have, um, that we represent, whatever that might mean, and reason about other people and what they're thinking. And I think that's what, what Roger meant. And that's, again, I don't, I'm not convinced it's amenable to pattern matching. Um, there are many people working on it. Um, this is work that was done in the logic-based paradigms and in the um, probabilistically based paradigms, and some people are still doing it, but it's in the more sciencey side of AI, and it's not yet ready for prime time on the engineering side. As AI develops, becomes more sophisticated, if you sort of look down the road 10, 20, 50 years, are we going to need to rethink what it means to be human? I think we'll understand better what it means to be human. In the best case scenario, that's yeah, we'll learn something useful and maybe even beautiful about ourselves. So, but redefine? <laughs> I don't know. How so? What are we going to learn about ourselves? Well, in the best case scenario, we learn something about how our minds work and how we actually reason with these patterns and how we figure things out by kind of constructing it and going, getting closer to a, a simulation of that. And, and also what matters to us in our thinking, what gets us to go in one direction instead of another. Why, right. do, we, why do we need AI for that, though? I mean, we, we, I mean, we've been thinking about this, wrestling with this, philosophers have wrestled with this for, for centuries, for millennia. Why, why, why AI? It doesn't have to be AI. Of, of, it could be something, something else. But um, I, my hope is that we, we get closer to be, be more aware of how important our representations are of mm -hmm. things. Because we, we are, all of us, we, we live uh, from day to day by representing things. And we built beautiful notation systems like um, notes for music and mathematics. We have calculus and we have beautiful um, symbolic languages to represent things. And through those uh, notation systems, we've been able to do wonderful things. But in, in terms of representing them efficiently and um, in, the, in the right way. So I hope that this, all this stuff with AI will teach us uh, something about the significance and importance of uh, representing things and make us more aware that we are actually just representing things. You're talking, so re I'm by not, representing I'm things, you're, I, just, I just want to drill down on this. For You're talking about actually trying to figure out what those things are. I mean, yes. it's, it's actually sort of figuring out what's real. You're saying we yes. have a lot of misconceptions right now, and this, yes. this actually maybe will see the world in a more accurate way. Yes. So there's a beautiful metaphor for this. It's the map and the territory. So the map is the representation of the territory. The territory is the real stuff. You know, the map's not the real stuff, but we navigate with the map. We use the map to see certain patterns in reality. So what I hope all this teaches us is that, you know, there are good representations and there are bad ones. And, you know, we can, we can 
choose the good ones over the bad ones, and we can be aware of this interplay. So I, I, we're surrounded by representations that we don't think of as representations anymore because we've gotten so used to them. Which is sort of language, right? And I mean, wor embodied. words are representing something that is supposed yes. to be real, and but maybe we get so caught up in the word that we forget about what it actually and that's is my, referring so to. That's my point, exactly. So, yeah, I want to I wanna just get back to the the first question that led us off into metaphors and maps, which I think we should continue with. Um, but you asked, wh what do you need AI for? And it's really back to what Roger uh, and I were saying in the beginning. If you do something on a computer system, you can experiment with it. You can see where it works and where it doesn't work. So it's a tool for pushing these representations and seeing how well they work and they don't work. And it's proved over the last several decades to provide insights to people who are asking questions in biology and in psychology um, also. And I have an uh, example that I'll, I'll use for you because it's relevant to you. I um, used to teach a course on computational models of discourse. And I would bring into the class a kind of uh, transcript of what people had said we were, this is way before Google Maps. This is in the 80s, <laughs> in the early 90s, um, giving people directions around Boston. And so we would take transcripts of this, and we would look at what was in the speech signal that told you when you were shifting from one area to the next. And so you could see, and this is true also across the dialogues we speak, that they chunk, just like written text chunks into paragraphs, and there are intonational signals to where those are. So I uh, bring into class a transcript which doesn't say where the breaks are, and the students try to find them. And I had as a guest one class uh, the uh, woman who was the voice coach for the American Repertory Theater. So one interesting thing is she looked at this, and she could immediately, I was amazed. She read the code. I mean, she, she could figure out what these codes might mean, even though... I thought they were pretty obscure. And she read the transcript like the people had said it. But the other thing, which connects to you, is she actually did training of people who were reading the news on the radio. And she took the theories I gave her from trying to do this with the computer, and she used them to revamp her teaching. Wow. <laughs> I want to um, throw it to uh, the our, our audience in a, in a couple of minutes here. But before I do that, I have kind of a a speculative question, really, for both of you. As you look into your crystal ball, uh, imagine what AI might be like, I don't know, 30 years from now or so. What do you? What are you both most hopeful about and what are you worried about? And there's sort of, uh, there's maybe some technical questions here, also maybe some ethical concerns. <laughs> wow, that's a, <laughs> that's a lot. Um, well... Wow. Yeah. Um, so there has been concern that, you know, AI is going to kill us all. Um, <laughs> so there's one anecdote um, that I want to bring up because I'm, I'm Norwegian and there's this Norwegian philosopher. His name was uh, Sapfa. He wrote a book called On the Tragic. Um, I thought of that when I read your question because he speaks about a particular kind of deer who developed antlers. This was a long, long time ago. And the antlers were so powerful that they ended up killing each other, and it's now extinct. And he compares this to human intelligence. We're too smart for our own, own being. Uh, so that's the tragic part. You know, we're too smart for this world. We, we are trying to figure it out, and it's going to kill us all. So that's the most pessimistic version. <laughs> <laughs> and now the good, can I, I'm more optimistic mm -hmm. than that. So the, the good stuff is that I, I, I hope adding on to what I just said, that um, we can build things that recognize patterns that would be hard for us humans to recognize. Uh, and that could be patterns in medicine, biology, psychology. Um, but it's, it's both a scary and a fun thought that so, you could invite a pattern recognizing machine into your, uh, into your life, and it would tell you uh, that there's a certain pattern here going on. Maybe you should change your... You know, so just to follow routine. up on that, you, you mentioned health. I mean, I'm presuming that there will be, I mean, the diagnostic potential, for instance, for recognizing patterns of certain diseases, yeah. uh, that could revolutionize healthcare. I think that's fairly obvious that that's a... That's a 
good effect of all of this. Mm -hmm. uh, Barbara, so, so, what about you? So um, I want to um, start by saying that I have an optimistic view and a pessimistic view also. And the optimistic view, which is where I hope the field will go, although it will depend on everyone to help nudge it in that direction, is it will change all of our lives in a very positive way. And the negative is that... Wait, 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 you can't wait, just... No, 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 I'm going to get there. <laughs> and health care is one of those. Um, and the, the negative is that we won't insist on it being designed well. Um, and at root, and this is, a, I will say, a soapbox, I think that AI should be used to build systems that complement our intelligence, not that replace it because they are good at things we're not very good at, and they're not good at things we are good at. And I'll just, um, so healthcare, education, if they were designed right, they could make a difference, and if they aren't designed right, they can make the wrong kind of difference. So there's a recent um, paper from someone working on a mammography <laughs> Um, image recognition for just the kind of thing that Roger was talking about. And this was a machine learning paper, and the, this particular uh, researcher's system had done the best in some competition. And the paper notes, sort of in passing, that um, th they're so proud of it because its error rate, now I'm not going to get it exactly right, but its error rate was 5%, which was pretty close to the radiologist 3.5%. And then they ran a test with the two of them working together, and the error rate was half a percent. Okay, so, you know, the machine will learn and it will do better. But over and over again, we see scenarios where if you couple a machine with a person, it's true in chess now, I think, or it was. Oh, yeah. For a while. yeah, so. so I hope it will go in that direction. And that means also that we will design machines and when we use AI for machines to do what they're good at, not try to get them to do what they're bad at, and then they fail. Okay, uh, let's uh, open it up to questions from the audience. Uh, there I think people want to prove that they're special, and they have for thousands of years. And um, we're the ones ruining the environment. <laughs> so I, I, don't, I, I don't want to try and define intelligence. I'm not, yeah, that's my reaction to that. <laughs> um, I don't think we're that special. <laughs> <laughs> we humans. That's one answer. I, yeah. I have another, which is, you know, we can build these amazing weird things and we can understand symbolic languages mm -hmm. that we do and we have not seen any other species that can, and that's kind of cool. Aren't you making a distinction in a way between our sophistication, our, I would almost say, technological capacity, and whether we have, whether there is moral virtue here? So there's something we do that, so far as I know, other species don't do, which is communicate and collaborate in a rather different scale from them. And um, that just gets us back to building systems that could collaborate with us. So I, I agree with that. But superior is such a, yeah. yeah. In what? <laughs> <laughs> and so um, I think we're at the very early stages of understanding the brain. And to measure something or to test something, you have to understand what you're looking for and how it's causally related to the things you're testing for. And I think that happens in medicine as well. And as, as you understand better what you're looking for, you get better tests. I mean, there are other ways to get better tests. Um, so uh, that's one answer. And the other is, I think overall, with the technologies we have now that are computer-based, there's a, a general problem of them res being designed the way they are because of who designs them. And it's one of the reasons that I think every child should study <laughs> computer science, because we need a more diverse set of people designing the systems we use. 
Well, there's so many answers, uh, and I, I, I agree. Um, so many answers to your your question. So people are researching uh, the brain, of course. We are scanning the brain um, and trying to figure out all that's going on in the brain and trying to correlate that with all that we know, but it's still a mystery. And there's this joke where, you know, the brain surgeon opens the brain and says, oh, there are no thoughts here. I can't see a single thought. <laughs> <laughs> and that's that pokes, uh, you know, yeah, that's a little, that's, that's, that's a good one because where are the thoughts? Where 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 is the consciousness yeah. in there? You know? And it's Nobody really knows. I mean, isn't that the fundamental problem here with some of the other parts of the body? You can pinpoint sort of the physical thing that's right. going on. The the brain, I mean, the we're talking about the mind as opposed to the brain. Yeah. Yeah. I, and, I love and, that joke. Yeah. <laughs> I love that joke. And, and, and enhancing the brain is also a possibility here. Uh, and it will become issues in the future where you can, you can put on a headset and zap your brain with some electricity and... Couple that with a machine that figures out how to do it the best way because it's really good at pattern matching. So I will try out all sorts of things and it figures out what makes you happy. And you're like, oh, this is fun. <laughs> Let's crank it up. And it, that, you know, that there will be a lot of issues like that. And it's do, do it yourself biohacking is already here. So couple that with, you know, pattern matching. And then, yeah. So it's a little scary, but uh, it'll, it'll, We'll, we'll certainly have brain checkups. <laughs> yeah, so, so lots of computers talk to each other in ways we don't understand. Um, <laughs> I mean, that's the whole internet works that way. Um, but I think there was, there, so I think it, it wasn't yielding what they wanted it to yield, and it looked worse than it was for what it was. So I, my guess is that's why they shut it down, but I don't know. Isn't that exactly what people worry about? The computers are going to have some secret conversations with each other, and that's, you know, step one to can, can, taking over the world? You know, so the, problem, the first thing is already true, and the second thing isn't a necessary consequence of it. <laughs> I'm telling you, your phone talks to other phones or to the Internet in ways you couldn't possibly understand. <laughs> Again, we're using metaphorical language, so the word, I mean, we're talking, the, the phones are talking? No, they're not talking like we are talking. They're sending some yeah. sort of signals. I mean, so it's, uh, yeah. 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 I mean, by the way, it's not hard to get two chatbots to, quote, talk to each other in ways that you can't figure out because they just go after patterns that they're looking for. And they don't, they aren't meaningful to us because they aren't meaningful to the chatbots either. They're just patterns. So it's um, also uh, very interesting to me that Turing in the same paper I mentioned suggests that the only way we'll get to AI is with learning. Now, remember when he wrote, so his idea of learning was um, that the way, maybe it's a comment on British education systems, I don't know, was that you just open up the head and pour in facts. Um, now we know now that's not how learning happens. And think about infants. Mm -hmm. Before they have words, they produce and understand intonation patterns. Mm -hmm. They know what you're doing. They start cooperating even when they're pre-verbal. They experience the world over and over again. Um, with the exception of some work in robotics, AI systems aren't doing that. Now, maybe that's the only way to do it, but... Um, uh, well, there, there are simulated interactions of systems, so, but, but I mean, it's very, it's, it's not just, that's what I, the point I want to make, it's not just pouring in facts. It's not just getting things to come and trying things wrong. It's a much more complicated, it is, as you've been saying, it's a very complex <laughs> set of interactions with the world. So one difference between the, the little kid and, you know, our, our current state-of-the-art artificial intelligence systems um, is that you need a lot of data to train a network with a computer, but you don't need a lot of data, um, as far as we know, with uh, our own brain. It, mm -hmm. It's really good at transferring um, what it has learned from one domain to another. And this is the stuff people are trying to figure out. If you've learned something, how can you transfer that to another domain? Mm -hmm. And 
that's that will be a key uh, to future research on artificial in intelligence. And we don't know it. If we knew, we would do it. And there there are, are attempts, serious attempts, to do that. If you train a computer to ride a bicycle, but now there's a motorcycle, it's different. But you know, a human would easily transfer one to the other. I mean, even with recognizing cats from dogs, the machines yes. need yeah. many more examples than a child needs. Well, cognition and computation might be the related, <laughs> as far as we know. What really goes on in the brain is is an open question. Is to is are we living a comp in a computational universe where everything is being computed? If you look at it very very closely, that's w um, one answer. Another one is this: um, a program can't analyze uh, itself. This self-reference thing. Um, there's a lot of good things and bad things to say about those sorts of arguments. I, personally, I, I like them because in, in logic you can create systems that somehow refer to themselves. And when you get, uh, get that thing going, if I put this microphone in the speaker, we get feedback. So there's some sort of loop going on. And the, our brain is amazing like that because we can think about thinking. We can mm -hmm. be conscious of being conscious. And... Um, how is it that we can do that? There's no inherent limitation for computer programs not to deal with other programs. There are certain logical, mathematical restrictions to what can be done and, and not. I have no idea if I answered your question or not. <laughs> Did I? I agree with that. The, the, the question was, or the statement, we don't understand cognition anywhere <laughs> near as well as we understand computation. I, I think I, we could all agree to yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. OK. Yes. Uh, there are now many um, reported cases where these neural network-based systems that take a lot of data and come to some conclusion and are then advising people on decisions to make have shown bias, and the bias that they can, show. Can you give some exa one or two well, examples of that? Um, uh, yeah, so there are um, uh, systems for putting this. So all of the ads that you see, unless you block them all, are driven by this kind of recognition. And the ads for jobs for women are different from the ad. They were. I mean, people fixed, sort of fixed it. When it, got, when it got noticed were different from the jobs for men. Different racial groups got different jobs. Um, there are issues with court cases. There are issues with uh, images. There's, um, there was one of the earliest examples was Google mislabeling a photograph of African American people as a gorilla, which, by the way, Google fixed that problem by just never using gorilla as what it talk about a hack um, but you know it wasn't just I mean that was a that was an example and a few weeks later a s uh, graduate student I was working with said her husband had been confused with a gargoyle and I know I mean he didn't look quite like you look Steve but pretty cl no, younger version <laughs> younger version younger version I don't think he looks like a gargoyle so um, uh, there are several problems with those. So first, I want to say people in the field are working very, very hard to fix this problem in many different ways and to understand what it would be to build a system that was fair, which I'll put in quotes. Um, one issue is the data that the systems are using. And one possible use of the systems is to reveal the bias in that data, which, by the way, you know, is also could be a bias. The data that people use to make similar decisions, for example, who's going to um, get parole and who's not going to get parole, is, could also be biased. And so the system could help with that. Um, and the other is to make the systems, um, to insist that the systems can explain what they're doing to be sort of a and therefore be accountable. And the other is to get more transparency into the system. So it is a problem. People should be aware of it. Anybody who uses a system to help them make a decision should ask about the data that it's based on. Okay, um, can but I people are working on it. Can I just back up for a moment? I mean, don't doesn't all of that have to be programmed originally? So in other words, if there is bias that's showing up in some of these sort of this pattern recognition, I mean, how did it get there in the first place? So 
so you know, so we were talking earlier, what do you, the question is what you mean by programming. The algorithm could be fine in terms of how it takes the data it gets and does the pattern recognition that was being talked about, but it could be given data that isn't good. So, for example, if the data it's given, 90% of the people who are doctors are male, and only 10% are women, and um, I won't pick what the 90% are women and not men, then it's not surprising it shows different. It shows different ads to women and to men. The question is how you correct that data in the bias, that bias in the data, and some of it is because of who's using the internet and where the data comes from. So you, you actually have to look behind the data that the algorithm is getting. And that's why I'm hedging about programming. It, it could be it's not the algorithm per se, it's the data, but then you want to ask how you redesign the algorithm so it in some ways first notices that the data might be skewed. Roger, did you want to follow I, up? I can only, uh, only agree. So there will be laws and legislation about training your um, computers um, in a non-biased, fair way, probably, because um, otherwise it would lead to very biased uh, systems. But there are many hard decisions other than that that needs to be made. For example, when you build a model of some something, anything, you need to figure out how granular you want to be. Mm -hmm. Do you want to lump every single human into one uh, box and say human, or do you want to divide that category up into um, different kinds of human? And then you get into all sorts of problems um, because you have to make a choice uh, on how granular you want your model to be. And this is the case with every everything in life. Every, we, we do this all the time. Some of us are very granular when it comes to, let's say, wine. <laughs> we are very, you know, and all some other some of us are just wine is wine so and when when you want a computer or a system to associate certain things you have to make all these decisions it's very hard <laughs> and it's only going to get harder i think but it's b because it's real this is this is real stuff and hopefully optimistically it will all teach us something fundamental about what what we are doing anyway because we are biased all of us are so maybe this will show us actually how biased we are we are So um, I, I start by um, saying, so first, I don't know the answer to your, to your question. But I want to say it's not clear to me either that we should try to, and I think you said this earlier, Roger, try to build an AI that does what the brain does. These neural nets are kind of a, analogous or a metaphor. Uh, the brain use it in that way. My own, my, my own feeling is we know how to replicate human intelligence. They're called children. And they have the problem that they have only human intelligence. And I think, and I also want to say it's the recent advances in some areas that are deep learning, but there were advances before in other areas. Um, I think that AI can um, really make a significant positive difference to our lives if designed well well before, if ever, it becomes a general intelligence, which is very different from what we have now. Uh, I, I, la, la, the last word, Roger. Oh, the very last? Yes. Well, I think people are going to try, and they are trying to do it at that magnitude. So I guess we'll see. <laughs> yeah, that's the short answer. <laughs> you have been a wonderful audience. We are out of time. Thank you so much. Thank you to our guests. Thank you.